listening to the Practical Astrophotography Podcast, where you are an absolute beginner with a smartphone, DSLR, or a seasoned professional with one-shot color dedicated camera, oh, you will find yeah. the tools, techniques, and advice needed to take your passion to the next level. If you're looking to improve your imaging skills, get insight from seasoned professionals, or hear stories of how others have started their astrophotography journey, you are in the right spot. So on today's episode, we're chatting with Nico Carver. Uh, Nico has joined us to talk a little bit about his imaging and how he got started and all things astrophotography. So welcome, Nico. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Gene. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to finally meet you. Um, Dennis has been talking you up, so it's nice to uh, finally get a chance to talk to you after we met at Neef. Yeah, it's, uh, was Neef uh, a good show for you guys? I, I had a lot of fun. It went by really fast. Yeah, Neef was, uh, I was unexpectedly surprised because the previous years, Saturdays were always very busy, um, and then Sundays kind of tapered off um, mid-afternoon because they had the speakers, um, whereas this year, Saturday was really busy, and Sunday was busy up until about, I think, four, quarter after four. Yeah, it was a good it was a good chance to get back and talk to people and um, see a lot of the vendors after being gone for two years, um, so it was definitely, it was definitely a good time. Yeah, I think there was a there was a lot of excitement this year for it. I mean, I hope to go every year now. And it's probably closer for you than it is for me. I'm in Carolina, so um, you and Dennis are in the north, so it's probably a little bit easier for you guys to go. So yeah, from New Hampshire, it's just uh, like four four and a half hours, so not bad at all. It's a good show to go to just to see new products, and then just to also see um, people you haven't seen, vendors. Um, we become good friends with different vendors and different um, people that we've come to know over the years. So it's it's just a good time to to get back in and see those people that you um, only see once a year. So yeah, why don't you take us back to um, where it all started? Um, where and how did you get started in imaging? So I've always really enjoyed uh, cameras and filmmaking. I started doing that in my teenage years. And then I went to college for filmmaking uh, at Hampshire College. And Hampshire College was interesting because they, the program was still run by filmmakers who wanted us to work with film. Even though digital was a thing by then, uh, they wanted us to work on Super 8 and 16 millimeter film. So I learned a lot about how cameras actually work and how to nail exposure and things like that from that experience. And then I didn't really um, have any kind of astronomy background or even that much of an interest in astronomy until I saw the Northern Lights in Alaska when I was working up there. And ever since that, I, I wanted to see the Northern Lights again. So I went back to Iceland with the goal of photographing them. And then that's what's really, that's what really turned me into an astrophotographer, that experience of, of being in Iceland, meeting other people who were doing the same thing, and uh, just being out under the stars and, and seeing how amazing the photographs came back uh, was what got me really hooked. So that led into uh, Milky Way photography, and then eventually uh, Deep Sky. And when I discovered Deep Sky, it was like a whole other uh, level of excitement, because as soon as I started photographing nebulae, they became my favorite kind of objects. And t still to this day, that's what I really love uh, shooting, our, our nebulae. So when you're in college, did you uh, start your very first imaging through like uh, Alaska and then through your trips? Did you start with DSLR or did you start with a film camera? Yeah, I, I started with a Canon. Um, really the first shot of the night sky I'd ever took was with a Canon T2i and a uh, 50 millimeter lens. And then by the time I was in Iceland, I had a Canon 5D Mark II, I think. So it's a full frame DSLR. And I, at that point, I had a Rokinon 14 millimeter lens, which is, is great for uh, the Aurora because it's a nice, fast, uh, wide lens for, for shooting those. But I, I actually wish that I had a circular fisheye on that trip because there was a night where the aurora completely filled the sky and i i just love those kinds of shots where you can see the aurora goes from horizon to horizon yeah it's interesting because when i was a kid um probably oh 17 18 years old i lived in western new york uh near dennis and my brother was actually he worked on a farm so he would have to get up um he'd work from like four to two in the morning and my father would get up um like around 2 a.m. to go and pick him up. And my father came in one morning and 
woke me up violently and, and said, you got to get outside. And we walked outside and there's the Northern Lights in Western New York. And I mean, this is 1995, 96, maybe. So for the Aurora Borealis to be in Western New York down that far, um, it's the only time I've ever seen it. And it was, uh, it was definitely a, a very spectacular event. And then I actually had a camera that was film. I didn't have, we didn't have DSLRs back then. We had film cameras. My dad had an old AE-1 Canon camera with a 50 millimeter lens. And then I had a, I want to say it was a, an AE-2 film camera. Um, 35 millimeter and I took I don't know two or three rolls of, of film and just hoped and prayed that I would get something and then took it to the uh two-day development got it back and was just amazed and obviously they weren't composed they weren't framed right they were just basically shooting at the at the sky uh from the back of the house there was no like there was trees in there there was just but it just to be able to catch those and that's pretty much where I got started as well because from then on it just showed that even with a film camera you could of what you could capture and much like you I started from there and got out and used my dad's AE1 and then the uh AE2 I think it was a Canon Elon is what it was but anyways we uh would spend countless nights out in the backyard focused at like the Big Dipper or even we had, um, I think we had uh, Yakataki and Hell Bop uh, comets back then and would go through countless numbers of uh, rolls of film and come back with nothing. Um, so it was, it was very frustrating at the beginning, but um, that's kind of much like you where I got hooked was the Northern Lights. That's really cool. Yeah. So I've never, well, no, that's not true. I, I've just trying to do astrophotography on film a few times and I just, because I wanted to get the experience of how challenging it was because I, of course, got started with DSLRs, but it was really, really, really difficult. I, I bought a little like um, viewfinder enhancer thing. So it would do like three times on the optical viewfinder to try to help focus. But then, of course, that seemed to make the image darker. So even on a bright star, I found it difficult to uh, focus the telescope properly. Do you remember how you would focus uh, back with those cannons? Yeah. So what I did is I actually, during the day, I would find a cloud or something in the far distance um, and I would focus it on that. And then once I knew I had focus, I would literally take a rubber band or some kind of a, a made up mechanism, cardboard, or even like sometimes I took a painter's tape and would tape it down so it wouldn't move. And then I would leave it out there so nobody touched it. And then I'd come back out at night, pull off the lens cap, let it um, acclimate to the temperature, and then that's what I would try. Otherwise, you really didn't. You'd have to like try to set it to infinity and then hope that you're at infinity. And that's probably why we went through so many rolls of film because some of the film Fuji back then, Fuji 800, was probably the most um, used stuff that we, the most used film we used. Half your photos weren't even uh, in focus. Other ones were out of focus. Some were in focus, but they like weren't even framed right. So it was, it was a struggle, but it was definitely, you got that uh, hook, line, and sinker, so to speak, where you just, you got any kind of object in the, in the viewfinder that came back on the film and you were hooked. Mm -hmm. So definitely. Now, why did you, now, why did you choose Canon? Was that something that you guys used in uh, college? Because I was interested, the reason I used Canon was because that's what my father had. My father had bought a Canon AE-1, so that's just what I always used was a Canon. And I've had friends that had Nikons, but when I actually went to buy Canon, I think Canon was more economical. It was within my price range. And because my father already owned one, I kind of knew that it was a good quality camera. So that's why I stuck with Canon, but I always am interested to hear because different people always swear by, oh, I use Nikon. Nikon's the best, or I use Canon. So it's just always interesting to hear why somebody chose Canon or why they chose Nikon. Yeah, I mean, going back to high school, I had Canon video cameras. This is like back when they were more like camcorder style. So I guess I I sort of started on like some Canon cameras that way. So then when I bought my first DSLR, probably like 2000 nine or 10 or something with a, I think it was a Canon T2i. It just seemed like, okay, I know that brand. And they were, they said the Canon, I think has the largest uh, market share in the world. So they they seem to be everywhere. I guess it was just sort of like a, yep, that makes sense kind of thing. But then, uh, you know, I started buying EF uh, mount lenses for the T2i and then the 5D Mark II. And then since then, many, many other Canon camera bodies. And once you build up a lens collection, you, it's it's a lot harder to switch. Uh, just since I started YouTube, I've tried out some Nikon uh, cameras, but I think I'll still always have some uh, plenty of Canon stuff around. Yeah, and to me, the Nikons, um, I don't know, when I went to buy my Canon, 
uh, camera at a camera shop way back in the days when I actually had camera shops. I just picked up the Canons and they just felt better in my hand. Um, whereas the Nikons, they had a little bit different feel to the actual grip. So I think that's another reason why I bought that. And of course, I use it for wedding photography and I use it for nature. I always go to the local um, the local park near me was Letcher State Park, which they call the uh, Grand Canyon of the East. So I would spend my weekends there taking waterfall photos, deer photos, wildlife photos. So that's kind of how I much like you, I got into the Canon and then I started buying the different lenses and um, even bought the adapters to, to use my father's lenses with the new Canon um, style lenses and the bodies. So it was an interesting time back then. And Dennis, what did you start with? You started with a Canon, right? Yes, I started with a Canon. My uh, my interest starts a little bit later than both you guys. Um, actually, my interest started with Gene. When I saw Gene's astrophotography, I said, boy, I need to be able to do something like that. And I started questioning Gene and looking into it. And I started out with a Canon T2i and then switched over to a uh, dedicated imaging camera and had been looking to go on a trip and picked up a Canon RA. So going mirrorless, I just really love it. Yeah, I, I love the RA too. I, I remember... When it came out, everyone was saying, oh, it's way overpriced at $2,500. But I, I picked it up right away. And um, until quite recently, I was filming all my YouTube videos with it. It's a great video camera. It's a great uh, daytime camera and an astro camera all in one. So I think it's a great all rounder. So it's uh, for me, it's worth the money. Yes, I actually picked mine up used just before a trip to Chile and then with Gene's help getting out and doing a lot of practice. I mean, that really, for me, was the key is, well, what do I need to do? I mean, how do I decide on what shots to make and uh, how do I practice with the camera? So Dennis speaks that he, he kind of had me there as a, uh, a mentor, so to speak. Um, when I was growing up, I really had nobody um, because the nearest city was 60 some miles away. So Nico, when you, when you got started, did you have any kind of a mentor or what did you, how did you seek out um, information to take those next steps as far as you're building your uh, your skills? So when I first got started with just sort of um, doing the camera lens kind of astrophotography, you know, the Aurora and Milky Way, I was really just sort of doing it uh, based on a little bit of internet research and still got some great shots without knowing too much. But then when I got into deep sky, I thought, okay, I should... Uh, seek out some people who know more about this. And I happen to live in Northern Delaware at the time, which has an amazing uh, club, uh, uh, the Delaware Astronomical Society, which has a group of astrophotographers that meet every month. So I, I got a lot of great advice from them. And my mentor was uh, Bill Hannigan, who runs the astro imaging group uh, in Delaware. And he just had so much knowledge uh, and we would it was it was really good to get sort of feedback on my images all throughout. Uh, you know, from the very beginning, we, I would come and we'd share images and talk about them and think about what we could do better. And uh, that really sort of set me on a path where I could advance in the hobby a, a lot quicker. Yeah, it definitely helps when you have a mentor or somebody you can bounce ideas off of. Um, and it definitely helps to keep the faith and kind of keep your um, interest in it. When I started, um, I went gung-ho, really bought five, six, seven different books and drove my parents crazy. But it came to a point where I kind of got burnt out because I didn't have that ability to basically ask a mentor or bounce uh, questions off of people that were more knowledgeable than I was. So I actually... Um, after I did it for six or seven years, I actually quit for quite a long time because I just got frustrated buying the equipment and then going out and not having any success. And then, of course, living in the north, you'd go out um, and nights that you did have clear skies, it was cold, very cold. Um, and then you'd have bouts of cloudy nights for weeks, uh, even months. It's definitely a good thing now that people have those abilities to jump on YouTube. They can jump on Instagram. They can subscribe to magazines and actually get that um, kind of mentoring without actually having somebody next to them um, that will help them to save money and help them to save countless nights of frustration. Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, when you're first starting out and you're brand new, I'd still advise to like start slow. If you're already a f photographer, you know, just start with what you have and, and, and do the wide field stuff and ease yourself into it. Um, I think for when you, when you first get the telescope and mount and all of that, it really does help to have someone there next to you who's more experienced. But 
then once you, once you sort of get past that initial learning curve, I totally agree with you that uh, YouTube and, and Instagram and all these new things that um, sort of built an online community for astrophotography really help people uh, escape that sort of trap of, of, of burnout because uh, you, can, you can have people sort of cheering you on and encouraging you and you can talk to more people. So. And like this, like a podcast, I mean, all this is sort of uh, new for the hobby and I think is uh, helping it excel into the future. I, one thing with the Delaware Club when I was getting started is I noticed, you know, there, there weren't that many young people. I was the youngest. Um, and so now I'm seeing seeing more through the internet, uh, young people getting into it. Yeah. And like you said, it's so easy to um, use what you have. So if you have a DSLR or you have a tripod, uh, whether you do it for your day job or you just like to do birding or, or daylight um, type of landscape, it's easy to make that transition uh, over to the nighttime. So that's kind of what we also suggest is when we get people, um, especially at NEAF, we had a lot of new people come up and ask us, well, what do you suggest that we get started with? Or what do you think is the is a beginner? A lot of parents will come up with their kids. We actually had a family, a really nice family, that had a son that was really interested and really wanted to get into it. And um, we actually have a time coming up where he can actually get on Zoom with us and we'll walk him through some uh, some basic uh, beginner things. Um, and the father is really, he's going to be there to support him any way they can. So I, I think that's the that's the good part about the uh, this hobby, that there's always people out there that are willing to help you out most often for nothing at all, nothing in return, just because they want to see you succeed. Yeah, that's great. That certainly was a, a big help to me. Sometimes I, I feel like I'm cheating, but it also really, when I'm able to share some of my experiences with other people, like uh, both of you have done, it really, it makes you feel good that you're able to help people along. Now, you mentioned, Nico, uh, you know, some of the challenges and such. I know we've all been into it. I know Gene's had some. I know I've had some and, and been frustrated. Are there any kind of frustrations or challenges that kind of stick out for you that you remember and maybe how you got around it? Yeah. So, I mean, my the one that really sticks in my mind is uh, when I, I got um, my first big equatorial mount. This was after I tried a star tracker. And then I was like, okay, I want to move on to bigger telescopes. So I got a Orion Atlas uh, equatorial mount. And at first I followed everyone's advice and put the like 80 millimeter refractor on it and with my DSLR and that was working great. So after three or four months of using the 80 millimeter refractor, I thought, oh, okay, I'm ready to get an eight inch Newtonian and use that. And so I did that and just had months and months of frustration trying to get it to work correctly. Um, you know, I'd have every problem under the book, trailed stars, collimation problems, focus problems. And so I think I spent eight months trying to just get a one usable image out of this eight inch Newtonian and just gave up and just decided to sell it. Uh, and then since then, I've always been a little bit sort of wary of, of going back to a Newtonian and have basically stuck with refractors. Now I, I have tried them again since and had a little bit better luck, but uh, th that's the one that really sticks in my mind is just all of these issues. And I couldn't figure out, it would be like, sort of like there'd be one issue. Um, and I think I'd sort of figure that out. But then as soon as I did, I'd see another issue. And I, I just could never really get an image that I liked out of it. Like you, I ended up buying a 10 inch Newtonian from Orion. Um, and I actually use that for years. And when it does work, it's a fantastic, Newtonians are fantastic. They're just a lot of extra work and they're a lot of tinkering and a lot of things have to go right in the same night in order for it to, to do what it needs to do to get you those good images. So yeah, I think now I, I'm, I'm now living in a house with a garage so I could like set up, uh, you know, tools and a shop and everything to do that kind of tinkering. When I did was doing this, I was in an, a little like one bedroom apartment kind of thing. So I just, I didn't really have like the setup to really tinker with my Newtonian. And, I, and so I think that was part of the problem too, is I was trying to do all this stuff with it, but just really had no idea what I was doing and I uh, could never really get it working how I wanted. And of course, the, you probably had a coma corrector that was causing all kinds of issues, and those got to be dialed in just right in order for you to get the the uh, rid of the start the trailing stars and get the nice pinpoint stars. Yep. Yeah. And I, I, looking back on it, I can now that I've just been in the hobby a long time, I think I know a lot of the problems I had. Like my coma corrector was extending into the light path, so that was causing some issues. Uh, a lot. Of, I was always just out in the open uh, with the with the Newtonian. So there was, I think, often wind gust problems because that, that's one issue with Newtonians is they, they, it's just such a big surface area for wind. Wind sails, basically. But they do make great uh, great scopes if you get them dialed in and they're even good for um, visual. 
Yeah, since I had that experience, ever since I've been thinking like, okay, eventually uh, I'm going to tackle that again. Um, I'm, this summer I'm planning to build an observatory, so I think once I do that, uh, I'll probably try newts again for imaging. Yeah, it's definitely nice to have a, uh, a permanent pier to set up your uh, equipment on and not have to worry about ripping it down and taking it apart and setting it back up because there's so many things that go wrong. So living in the north, how do you, like I spoke of before, how do you deal with periods where you have no clarity or transparency in the sky? How do you, what do you do on those nights? Do you uh, do you spend those nights processing or do you just do something else? Um, with smaller refractors, the the sky conditions are a little bit more forgiving. Like it, I, I've now, I now have this like a one thirty, so like a five inch uh, refractor, and now I can definitely see all those differences in seeing between one night and, and the next. But with a with a small refractor, sometimes you don't even really see those seeing differences, just because the the resolution isn't good enough to really see them. In terms of the cloudy weather, yeah, there's not much you can do other than just drive. Uh, so I do have sort of spots all over. Uh, the New England area. So if I really feel like it, I can just get in the car and drive to a spot that's clear. Um, so I sort of monitor about five different uh, locations. Yeah, so that's a that's a good idea, Dennis. When's the when's the last clear night you've had? Um, actually, the last clear night I had was in Chile, and it was on top of the mountain. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I had to travel all the way to Chile to get good clear skies. Western New York has been very, very difficult. We're lucky if we get maybe four very clear nights a year for excellent imaging. Um, and then, like you said, the rest we kind of have to deal with. Um, and that's also one of the reasons that I've kind of stuck with that small refractor uh, in that wider field imaging, because it can be a bit frustrating at times when you don't have all of that clarity like you have out in the, the Midwest and the West in Arizona and such. But uh, it can always be a challenge, but I, I actually enjoy some of the challenge too. Now, Nico, when you're doing your astrophotography, when you're sitting down and like you said, you travel to different spots, um, do you do some kind of planning for it? Is there something that you go through when you're kind of putting your images together? Is there something that like driving your shots or your composition? Oh yeah, I, I always plan what I'm going to do. Um, so there's a good website, telescopius.com, where you can sort of put in your gear and then sort of see the composition ahead of time. And I always like to do that. I, I really love playing around with composition in deep sky imaging. So like instead of just centering the deep sky object, think about, okay, are there some dark dust lanes you can play with or maybe bright stars to... Uh, work into the composition. So I'm always, yeah, trying to plan out what I'm going to do. And then a lot of times, you know, because we get so few clear nights, I try to pack in as much into a clear night as possible. So I'll bring multiple setups, uh, you know, get there before dark and try to set up multiple things and then have some just be completely automated and then be working with others uh, throughout the night. So for the beginners that don't have the ability to have a, uh, a budget where they can have multiple rigs or multiple imaging setups, what, uh, what advice would you give them um, as far as getting out there and maximizing their, uh, their time under the clear sky? Um, practice, <laughs> practice everything at, at home. You know, so I, I think there's multiple levels of practice you can do. You can do indoor practice. So if you have new gear, you know, practice indoors just you know sit on your couch and make sure you can connect everything and understand how it all works and then you can do outdoor practice even on a night that's not that great like you know semi cloudy you wouldn't do serious imaging but you can just sort of look for patches of clear sky and get and get some basics down and then when you actually have like a clear sky at a dark site you'll be a lot more ready to just jump right in and and start imaging because i think that's the thing that happens a lot is people just wait till they're at the dark site and think that they'll figure it all out but then you can spend the whole night just trying to figure stuff out um so i would i would try to figure it all out before you get there and that's good you mentioned that because we actually have a uh, article in in last month's uh issue called clear nights of frustration and it's also a uh, a podcast topic that we have coming out uh pretty soon so it's, it's exactly what the what we gave for kind of uh suggestions or advice to, to people to get out there and, and do a trial run, set up their equipment and uh, go through the whole setting up from your mount to your uh, telescope to your 
to your guiders and then basically strip it all down and make sure that when you do, you have it organized. Um, so when you get out there next time, you're not hunting for cables, you're not hunting for a dew heater, you're not hunting for gaffer's tape to connect something. You just got everything in line, ready to go so you can maximize that time under those clear skies since um, in the north you do have those uh, very far and few between clear nights. Now down here in Carolina, I happen to have probably, I would almost say probably close to 200 nights I have. Um, because where I where I am, we're down near a uh, we're backed up to the a uh, national forest, so we don't have any um, nearby cities, and the weather pattern just happens to be um, just right where we don't get a lot of that cloudy skies. So I'm very fortunate to have moved from the cloudy north to the uh, to the clear sky south. Wow, that's amazing! I, I wouldn't think in the Carolinas you would get that many clear nights. That's really cool. Yeah, and it's just the, it just seems to be the area that we're in because if you go an hour to the east or an hour to the uh, north, it's like soup. We got lucky or or uh, maybe we planned it um, without knowing it. Yep. Really, what's helped me out the most is taking that time to practice and on those nights that aren't absolutely perfect, doing what I can out there and just going through the routine and learning it, it makes a big difference. For me, going over to that DSLR because I was going on a trip out of the country, uh, hitting the Southern Hemisphere for the first time, I did lots of practice in setting everything up. And so I was able to get polar aligned in the Southern Hemisphere in 30 minutes and be spot on for focus because I had done all that practice, even took the extra step of going off to a planetarium to look at the Southern sky and to even practice polar aligning in the side the planetarium. Fortunately, we had a friend who ran the planetarium, so it was we were able to do that. But yeah, practice is a big factor in astrophotography. That's a really cool idea of uh, <laughs> practicing southern hemisphere polar alignment in a planetarium. I've never thought of that. I'll have to remember that one. Yeah, it was it was kind of fun to do because my friend and I kind of overplanned the trip a little bit. We were actually going meteorite hunting, but we're both astrophotographers as well. And so we planned to do some astrophotography there and uh, we set up to do it. And it was a, certainly a, a fun time. Now, you mentioned uh, that you love nebulas. Do you have a, a favorite object that you like to image? Is there something that you like to go back to? And then are there any kind of objects that you might consider that are good for a beginner, maybe something that in the intermediate level and maybe something for the expert. Yeah. So I'll try to answer those in order. So the one that I've gone back to many times is the witch head and I've never, and part of the reason I keep going back to it is I've never been satisfied with my image of it. Uh, so I've probably gone back to it about five times and still want to go back again because I, I've just never really gotten the image I have in mind with that one the Witch Head Nebula in Orion. It's a reflection nebula that's sort of lit up by the bright star Rigel. Another type of nebula that I love shooting are supernova remnants, which are usually pretty difficult ones They're, they're because they're very dim, uh, typically. Uh, so a favorite of mine is the Spaghetti Nebula in Auriga, I think. Uh, or maybe Taurus, I can't remember. It's, I think it's in Auriga, and it's it's huge in the sky. So I, I've shot it with a telephoto lens, but a mono camera using narrowband filters, and it comes out really well that way. For beginners, uh, I always tell people, uh, you know, my first deep sky object, as I'm sure many people, first deep sky object was Orion Nebula. And that's the, that's, I think, a great one to start if you're shooting in the winter in the Northern Hemisphere. In the summer, the, what I think is the best nebula to, to start with is the Lagoon Nebula. If you are far enough south to, to catch that one. You know, it, even where I am in New Hampshire, there's there's times of the year where the, the Milky Way core gets high enough that you can shoot the Lagoon Nebula. And it's, it's uh, like Orion, it's just very, very bright. Uh, it, it really stands out. Uh, and it, from a very dark sky, you can really even sort of see it naked eye. It's so bright. Yeah, it's one of my favorites because it's so bright. It lends itself to that level of satisfaction that you sometimes don't get with those real dark nebula or those uh, dim reflection nebulas too. Yeah, and Orion is one of the, probably the best objects because it's bright, it's easy to locate, and in the wintertime you usually have better skies, so you're going to have clear nights to uh, image it. You're not going to have to worry about the summer nights where you have more of the humidity in the air, so Orion is probably one of the favorites for everybody, and I think that's probably one of the most submitted objects that we get to the magazine for people that um, submit their images for publication is is of Orion. And I think you probably can contest to this, um, Nico, but I've 
I've spent the longest Orion um, image that I've spent actual integration time, I think is 20 hours. So you probably being on the uh, Witch Head Nebula and the Spaghetti Nebula, you probably spent hours and hours of uh, acquisition time on those. Yeah, I think the Spaghetti Nebula was something like 16 hours, but it was at f2.8 with the telephoto lens. So a, a nice fast uh, optic to to bring that down. If I was shooting it, you know, with a telescope, like at f5, it'd probably be 30 or 40 hours to get the same result. Yeah. And then the witch head I've usually shot, I think, with telephoto lens too. So again, it, it works a bit better with a, with a fast uh, lens on these dim objects. Uh, the, my biggest, uh, my longest integration on any project was a, is a mosaic in Cygnus. And I put, I've put um, 230 hours into it so far. So, but that's with uh, many different filters. So I, I decided I wanted to shoot this big mosaic with all the different filters I had available to me. So just to see what came, comes back with it, each filter. So I shot it in all the narrow band and broadband filters. Yeah. And some of the other favorites that I suggest would be like M31, um, M45, the Pleiades. Those are um, good targets that are easy to usually capture and they're high enough in the sky um, that you don't have to worry about. You have plenty of time before you have to do a meridian flip. So for beginners, they can get a lot of data um, before it actually gets too high to the zenith. But they're yeah, those are uh, good suggestions. Yeah, and all the ones you just uh, all the ones you just mentioned, you can do without a tracker too. I on my YouTube channel, I've shown you can do those all uh, just with uh, short exposures. Even they, they're they're so from a dark sky, you know, they're they're so bright that uh, even if you just stack a couple hundred short exposures, you'll you'll get something sort of pleasing from from any of those M thirty one, M forty five, M forty two. Yeah, and you don't really. Um, there's an article coming up in this uh, this month's issue that we did about literally stacking images. A lot of people the misnomer and, and one of the myths in the uh, hobby is they think that you need to use Pixinsight, you need to use Photoshop, you need to use Astro Pixel Processor, or any of these other ones that you need to know, um, which are like the learning curves are um, massive. So they they think you got to know these big intricate involved many processes to, to get these good images. And you can get just by using ASI Studio DeepStack. Uh, you can spend basically five minutes with good data, introduce your lights, your biases, and your flats, and literally push stack. And within five or 10 minutes, you can have an image that's worth posting on social media. Yep. And Serial 2 is very easy. You just put all those into the folders and use a script, use one of the scripts, and it, it goes through them all and does it all for you quite quickly. Yeah, so now going back to what you just mentioned before about your um your your long integration, what do you what is your go to processing software? I, I have them all. Um for that I used mostly PixInsight. I I am sort of uh changing a little bit. I, I I was a PixInsight and Photoshop user mostly, but uh lately this program Cyril S I R I L has been getting so good uh -huh. that I've been using that more and more. Yeah, that's been pretty popular lately. Yeah, and it's it's free, and uh, the developers are quite active. Uh, they're they're putting in more and more stuff into it every release, so it's it's getting sort of competitive uh, with uh, some of the bigger programs. But like you said, with sort of ease of use of ASI Studio, I, something I like about Serial for beginners is it's it has this script where it's a literally a one button script for all the pre processing, so you don't have to change any settings or anything. You just put your your lights, your bias, your flats and darks into folders and press run and it will go through them all and do it all for you. Yeah. And that's what a lot of beginners don't realize is they think that you have to, well, I mean, a lot of people online, a lot of uh, images online always post and that you can see that the majority of them use PixInsight and PixInsight is a very daunting software um, to get started. And that's kind of a myth that you got to have this big 1.21 gigawatt processor with a uh, 128 gigs of RAM. You got to have like four terabyte hard drive just to be able to do some of these images. And for a lot of beginners, that's uh that's not cost effective when they don't have that kind of money, especially when they've they've basically spent two or three thousand um, dollars at the minimum to buy a decent mount, a telescope, and a DSLR. So when I started 25 years ago, I really got into using Photoshop. Um, I think it was Photoshop 7 version 7. So, and I went to college for graphic design. So of course I not only learned how to use Photoshop, but I also learned 
the science behind it. So like why you change um, your levels, why you change your curves and what that actually does to the data and how it actually works. And I think that kind of helps out a lot is if you actually understand why you're doing something rather than just saying, okay, let's go watch YouTube. I'm just going to do that. And then hopefully I get what I'm supposed to get at the end. But if you actually understand why you're doing it, um, then uh, it makes a lot more sense. And then you can kind of understand what you're doing to the actual image to kind of get where you're supposed to be get. And I think that's the biggest thing is trying to get people to understand that if you if you sit down and learn why you're doing it, not just how to do it, but why you're doing it, things seem to come easier. Yeah, I mean, uh, like you, I've been using Photoshop uh, for a long time. <laughs> I think I started using it at age 12. Uh, so, and then I taught Photoshop professionally for a while. And it's it's a... It's hard. It's a it's a mix of uh, people want results, but then I agree with you. If you if you can take your time and actually learn how all of these processes work, you'll 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 be better in the end. But uh, for teaching people Photoshop quickly, I found that uh, over the years I've sort of refined my take, and and uh, a lot of it is I think sometimes you you need that. Okay watch me do it and then you do the same thing and they see the results and then they see that oh this is working and that that keeps them excited if you i've i've seen some instructors try to sort of explain things so much that uh i think you can get lost right if you if you try to just really explain how something is working uh, but it's, it's different personalities some people like one thing some people like another I, I went through a bunch of sort of online instructors for for photoshop and found that i could get on with some and, and not with others uh over time yeah and nowadays i think with the advent of digital slrs um the amount of patience that people have um it seems that people are are more impatient and they want results now so if they can just go out and spend several hours uh, acquiring that data and as long as it's decent data they can just go into serial uh, upload their files into folders and then push one button and they can walk away and come back and have some kind of a result i think people are more interested in doing that because they don't want to put in the actual time or the effort to learn why you're changing your levels, why you're doing a mask, or why you're doing uh, curves, or or why you're adjusting in 16-bit and not 12-bit. So it, I guess it all depends on the individuals. But if you're somebody that really wants to learn and get into it, I guess it just depends on, like you said, it depends on personalities and, and what how deep you want to get into it. For me, too, I think that it's, it's kind of where I started. I kind of wanted that immediate gratification, but then in turn, that immediate gratification led me down that path of learning more and understanding more, and it's a, a constant process. And I think that's what I find really exciting about astrophotography. Not only can you get that immediate gratification, and now sometimes with something like the Canon RA, it almost feels like you're, you're cheating a little bit. It lets you get that good data and it gives you that sense of satisfaction so that you can progress down that line so that you want to learn a little bit more. Things like uh, Adam Block goes into the detail because I like to know about that detail. I want to find out now, great, I've got this image. How? What else can I do? And why is it turning out this way? So it helps raise that question, you know, and, and keeps it together. So I, I find both really helpful. Yeah, that, yeah that's a great point. And um you know, yeah, something, someone like Adam Block, I just like watching his videos, not even when I'm trying to solve a problem, but just to hear his thoughts on uh, on imaging, because he often goes into all of these interesting asides about about what he's actually looking for in an image and what and and then how he can use the tools to actually achieve this uh, goal in mind. Uh, that that was the one thing I wanted to ask him about when I was out on the West Coast was this idea of pre-visualization because he talks a lot about that, about, you know, a photographer's eye, you sort of have this uh, vision of what your image should look like and then how to actually use the processing tools to achieve that. And I feel like that's extra hard with astrophotography. It's uh, just something about, you know, teasing out these details where we don't even know what they're going to look like because they're, they're basically invisible until you start processing them. Yeah, and that kind of leads up to the next question I think Dennis has, um, and Dennis can can elaborate on this, but what, do, what are your thoughts on um, composites as opposed to scienti scientific um, images and then artistic images as far as imaging? 
So people have different meanings when they say composite. Some people think that even sort of stacking multiple images together is some kind of composite imaging. I don't really see it that way. Uh, but, you know, because professional astronomers will, will stack images together too to improve the signal to noise ratio. Um, I'm these days I mostly do uh, deep sky work where the, the only the only kind of processing I'm doing is the calibration stacking and then changing saturation and levels and all that kind of stuff. So normal things. But an, another sort of meaning of composite is, you know, taking one set of photos for a landscape and then another set of photos for the sky and putting them together. And I've, I've experimented with that. What my sort of ethical approach to it is I just, if I don't move the tripod, so I, I, or, you know, the orientation of the camera or anything like that, it's, it's staying in one place. Then I think, uh, composites can be interesting. I don't like this style of astrophotography where you take a, a very, you take a nice clean Milky Way in one spot and then find an interesting landscape somewhere else and composite them together, but they have no relationship to one another. To me, that feels like a little dishonest. I mean, because it's, it's even if you explain in the caption that you've done that, most people don't read the caption, right? So it's just like they just see that image and assume that that's uh, a truthful image. But if you're taking things from completely different places, it feels a little bit uh, weird to me, at least. Yeah, so one of the things I've seen a lot is people will take a picture of, like, say, uh, Andromeda, and they will take a landscape photo, and they'll put them one-to-one -one without actually putting them in in the actual one-to-one -one ratio that they are. So if you look at the photo, um, Andromeda takes up, like, the, the whole upper one-third of the photo. So you think that if you go outside in your backyard and you look up in the sky that you're going to see Andromeda that's going to be basically the size of the moon. Um, and that's kind of where I have an issue because, like you said, a lot of people don't read captions and there's so many images out there as it is now that you come across Google or Yahoo or Bing or wherever you're searching and you see this image where Andromeda is just gigantic in the sky, it gives a false sense of what's actually in nature and what what you actually see when you go out there. So you have different expectations. And a lot of it, I think, also is when you go to star parties and you have people looking through your telescope and they're like, well, I saw this photo. Why can't I see that? And it's like, well, because that's not really what you'll see in the sky. Like what you actually see in the sky it's not going to be that large. That's where I sit as well. I can understand some the art. I mean, there's an art to astrophotography. We bring out that aspect of, like, you, Nico, you mentioned that this stuff is invisible to our eyes. We have to use this technology to bring it out. And then where do we really draw the line between saying, hey, you know, this is the technology bringing it out, or, you know what, this is just a piece of art that I created taking several different shots. And, um, I think that in astrophotography, that line gets crossed sometimes, and I don't know if it's very helpful to us or not. I'm not sure. I'm kind of sitting the fence on that one still, but it's quite interesting to see, and I know that I get frustrated when I see images, like you said, putting it, you know, there's no way that this image could have ever been taken. This is a composite image, and then you look down in the tiny corner and say, oh, yes, it's a composite image, or what really frustrating is when people post this stuff online and say, look at this image that I took. And it's very clearly, you didn't take this image, you took several different images, put them together, and created a piece of art um, with what exists in nature. And I'm not sure I, I kind of like that representation. The way I use social media is sort of, uh, if if there's something I, if, if I'm following someone and it's like, oh, I don't, they keep doing things like that, I just don't follow them anymore. So I, I sort of... Uh, uh, curate my feed so I, I just get to see sort of the images I like seeing kind of thing um so a little less uh your blood pressure doesn't go up as much if you just sort of curate your feed a little bit. <laughs> yeah very very true yeah and as as imagers we also have to think though because now nowadays a lot of people are just out there for the clicks if I get 200,000 views or 200,000 likes on my image then people use that to their advantage whereas I'd rather post something that's honest and true, even though it may not be getting 200,000 likes or 200,000 views, at least it's something that people can come to my feed or come to my images and actually know they're going to see something that is going to be as 
true to life as possible. Now, I mean, I can, like you said, I can give more saturation, I can give more brightness, I can change hues, and I can change my RGBs, which a lot of people have been doing lately. There's a couple of uh, Orion horsehead um, images going around lately that they're purplish and they're bluish and they're really a, a different take. But as long as people mention that, hey, this is my my rendition or this is this is my idea of um, art and it's not necessarily what you'll actually see as colors when you look through a telescope, that's fine. But it's also going back to what you said before about how people don't read captions and most of the time people will just see that and then that's what they expect to see when they go out there. Yeah, I think I think that the the part, the part you're talking about of sort of like what people expect from a photograph versus what they're going to see through an eyepiece, that sort of needs to be a more, a bigger education kind of thing. Because I mean, you're never, you're never going to see the kind of colors that you can pick up with, uh, with a long exposure photograph. Even if I just take a, a long exposure of the Milky Way, for instance, with my, can- with my Canon RA and my lens, a uh, two minute exposure tracked. You see all this brilliant colors, which you, but if I look at that same scene with my eye, even from an incredibly dark sight, it looks just sort of gray, right? But that's just sort of a limitation of our eye. It does, it's not because the objects out, are, out there aren't colorful. Very true. Yeah. So, um, one question I have is do you have any favorite destinations? Have you traveled to any star parties um, in different states? You said you mentioned you're on the West Coast. Do you have any other, any favorite destinations you like to um, go back to or, or any favorite destinations that you enjoy doing your imaging from? Yeah. So um, I started in Delaware, then I came up to Boston and now I'm in New Hampshire. From Boston, uh, there's a really great observatory called Frosty Drew and then a, a whole big park around it down in Rhode Island called Ninigrit park that's uh that's very nice for for imaging from probably my sort of uh best experiences with just being out under the night sky have been in death valley national park and at the oki Tex star party so both out west uh but those were both like true Bortle one sites so i i definitely encourage anyone who's interested in stargazing to try at some point in their life to get to a true kind of portal one dark sky uh, because it, it's something else to see that many stars and to see the clearly defined uh, Milky Way. Yeah, and it's definitely, I don't know if you noticed this, but when I, for the 2017 eclipse, we went out to Casper, Wyoming, and we went up on Casper Mountain um, the night before the eclipse uh, with Anthony Davoli from ADM, and um, the sun was setting, and already you had the Milky Way starting to be displayed, so you were basically almost in a twilight zone where you had you had these two different sides where it was just amazing because it wasn't even, the sun hasn't even set yet. And here you have the Milky Way already visible. It was just that dark and that, that crystal clear up there on the mountain. So it's it's definitely Bortle 1, Bortle 2. Um, it's an amazing uh, experience to be able to get out there to those kind of sc- skies. Yes, and I'll have to throw my hat into that ring too. And for me, it was the middle of the Monteraki crater in Chile, a true Bortle 1 sky. And it will sit with me for forever and the the data that you can acquire in there was was unbelievable true dark skies they are amazing and they also bring up their own set of uh problems because if you are not used to it you go out there to a truly dark sky you could be setting up your scope and trying to polar align on something that's not even polaris and then you realize that hey this isn't even polaris what am i doing um because it's just so dark that every star in the sky is visible and polaris is just like any other star and it's just not like a dead ringer as far as trying to find it and that's that's interesting yeah my my tip for that is is start at dusk uh looking for polaris because it will start standing out a little bit earlier but then yeah if once it gets fully dark it's a lot harder to find it yeah and we always suggest you can use a compass as well if you take a compass and set up your uh your mount you can get your uh alignment pretty darn close um by using the offset degrees so that's a another good way to uh to make sure that you're in the ballpark before you get started. I mean, of course, you can cheat and use a um, a pole master or uh, something similar. But in wrapping up this podcast, what's a fun fact uh, about yourself that people would be interested to know? Do you have any other hobbies outside of uh, imaging or anything outside of astronomy that you enjoy? So I was a librarian for an academic librarian for, for 10 years. So books and reading and book collecting has always been sort of a hobby of mine. I, I also, you know... Uh, had an interest in uh, the classical music of Indonesia 
so I went over to uh, Indonesia and studied gamelan for a number of years. So I've had some uh, sort of past lives of different things I've been interested in, uh, but astrophotography has seemed to really <laughs> been a, a new kind of level of passion, right? I've never experienced something this engrossing before. Uh, so hopefully I, it'll, I won't get burned out on astrophotography because now I'm doing it full time. But uh, yeah, I guess my fun fact is, is just uh, that I... I, I love gamelan, which is uh, this classical music of Indonesia. It's a percussion orchestra, basically. That's interesting. I'll definitely have to uh, have to look at that up after the podcast and check it out. Um, so for anybody, if there is anybody out there, um, and there may not be, but, but if there is anybody out there that's not familiar with your work, where can they find you online? Um, nebulaphotos.com is my website. And then uh, I also am Nebula Photos on YouTube. Probably YouTube is uh, where most people find me because that's where I have the, the biggest following of fans. All right. Well, I think that uh, that'll wrap it up for this episode. So we want to thank Nico for taking the time out of his day to uh, join us. It's been fun and it's been interesting to, uh, to hear somebody else's perspective about their uh, imaging journey. So thanks. Thank you. You just heard the Practical Astrophotography Podcast. Don't forget to follow or subscribe to be notified for upcoming episodes. Visit us at practicalastrophotography.com slash podcast. Until next time, here's wishing you clear skies. Oh, yeah.